welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. Just imagine a vehicle smashing through your fence, barreling across your property, and packed with migrants and smugglers armed to the teeth with high-powered weapons. Where is that going on? That's what's happening in Texas at the southern border of the United States. At long last, the vice president has said, quote, don't come. But this weak gesture is too little, too late. So how do we fix it? CBN's Abigail Robertson reports from the southern border. Here in South Texas, the increasing number crossing the border isn't just affecting law enforcement. Local landowners must also deal daily with uninvited guests trespassing on their property. It just seems to be getting worse and worse. Justin Cappadona described to CBN News his experience living in a border town. We've had uh, groups come up in, into our backyard uh, on the backside and, and uh, approach us looking for uh, food and water. And he says the groups are getting bigger. I've seen anywhere between 15 and as many as 30 people come out of a vehicle. Many ranchers are also experiencing damage to their personal property, constantly repairing fences and gates that are struck by vehicles fleeing law enforcement, and the property owners are left footing the bill. Well, what ends up happening is you can see the vehicles will be coming down. If, it's, uh, if they're being chased by Border Patrol or, or uh, Sheriff or, or DPS, what happens a lot of times is that at some point they decide that uh, they can't get away, so they'll end up crushing through, these, uh, through the fence. They usually take out a couple of posts here, uh, bring the fence down, and then they'll get on uh, a caliche road such as this, and they'll continue on, and then they'll go out in, into the ranch. A neighboring rancher who requested to remain anonymous tells CBN News the trespassing groups are getting more frequent and aggressive, armed with high-powered weapons. And on their property, they're finding everything from drugs to dead bodies. How do you fix it? Uh, I, I don't know. You know, I think uh, probably a combination of, of border wall and, and immigration policies. In March, Governor Greg Abbott launched Operation Lone Star, deploying the Texas National Guard and Department of Public Safety to help improve air, ground and marine security. What DPS is doing is absolutely necessary. The governor is right by trying to do something down here. But it has a ripple effect that causes a negative impact on our communities throughout the state of Texas. Sheriff Roy Boyd is 200 miles from the Rio Grande Valley and his county still feels the problems at the border. In Goliad County, is we're having stash sites that the cartel is using to store illegal aliens, to strip stolen trucks, to store and to move drugs towards the larger market in Houston. But the resources now addressing immigration issues mean less law enforcement helping local citizens. To be quite frank, the problem that we have with all of the efforts that we're doing right now is none of these efforts are actually designed to win the war that we are facing with our neighboring you know, country of Mexico and the cartels that, that reside there. And the added security is expensive. Texas is spending $2.5 million a week just with the highway patrol that's stationed here at the border. Uh, in addition to that, we have the National Guard who's here by order of the governor. Uh, that's another roughly $2 million a week that we're spending just in helping secure the border. Texas Congressman Michael Cloud recently led a group of representatives to the border to see the crisis firsthand. Just a few months ago, this crisis point was mitigated as a crisis. You know, you're always going to have a little bit of tension at the border, but as uh, the overwhelming crisis that we were uh, that we're seeing now was, did not exist because of the policies that were put in place by the Trump administration. He warns this isn't just Texas's problem. Now the Biden solution to the surge at the border has been to transport everyone throughout the U.S. So this this issue that we've known here in Texas for a while has been exacerbated, but now is being transported uh, throughout communities throughout Texas. So it's been said that every town is now a border town, and, and you can see how that's playing out. Cloud argues the answer is simple. Return to policies that worked and finish Trump's border wall. Reporting from McAllen, Texas, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Isn't it amazing? President Trump knew what was being necessary. He wanted to put a wall up. And all how they fought him, how they, they wouldn't give him any money to build the wall. If he'd built it, he could have kept some of these people out. But no, 
And he used to have a policy that if they came, they, they couldn't get into this country. He didn't allow it. And the Biden administration has said, look, we're free. We're, we're open for business and we welcome you. Now they're saying we didn't welcome you. But uh, so President Biden appointed the vice president to take care of the border situation. So did she go to the border? border? She traveled to Guatemala and Mexico. But why didn't she go to the southern border? And when asked about it, why did she just giggle? Ephraim Graham has more. Pat, Vice President Harris wrapped up her trip to Mexico and Guatemala Tuesday. Critics point out some from her own party, she still has not visited the border since President Joe Biden tasked her with tackling the migrant crisis. When NBC's Lester Holt asked her why she hasn't been to the border, the vice president gave a contradictory and confusing answer. We've been to the border. So this whole, this, whole, this whole thing about the border, we've been to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. And I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't understand the point that you're making. I'm not discounting the importance of the border. Administration officials say the vice president's role is to fight the root causes of illegal immigration by working with Latin American leaders to address corruption, crime, and poverty in those nations. Turning now to Virginia, a judge ordered a Loudoun County teacher reinstated after he was suspended for refusing to refer to transgender students by their chosen name and gender. Citing his Christian faith, Tanner Cross told the school board he would never, quote, affirm that a biological boy can be a girl and vice versa. It happened during a board meeting in May over a proposal requiring teachers to address transgender students by their selected names and genders. The judge called the suspension an unconstitutional action, which silenced others from speaking on the issue. And staying in Virginia, Democrat Terry McAuliffe won his party's nomination for governor Tuesday. McAuliffe served as Virginia's governor from 2014 to 2018. He'll face Republican businessman Glenn Youngkin in November's election. McAuliffe called his opponent too conservative for a state that's elected two Democratic governors in a row. Youngkin says those governors have made Virginia less safe and less economically competitive. Pat, back to you here. Well, it's an interesting uh, statement. There's some in Virginia that wonder, uh, would it be possible for Virginia to give Loudoun County to Maryland? that it might make a, a nice transfer. Really? They, they actually gave the, the uh, southwestern uh, counties to West Virginia. So, I mean, they say, well, maybe we can give Loudoun away. <laughs> but this, uh, the, there's a, uh, the Republicans have named a, a black former student of Regent University as their, as their uh, lieutenant governor running mate. Nice. And, uh, Glenn Youngkin is a brilliant economic, uh, I mean, yeah. moneymaker. He was in charge of a major hedge fund, and he's a very wealthy man and very intelligent. And um, I think the stuff that's going on in Loudoun County and, and some of the other things that are taking place in this critical race theory that's being jammed down people's throats, the people in Virginia, maybe, maybe they'll finally rise up. But, it's been remarkable how this country has gone from strong conservative to strong or liberal, but uh, the state may change. And well, I live here, so <laughs> I'd like to see something happen. Ephraim. <laughs> Pat, President Biden begins his first international trip today, departing for the United Kingdom and the G7 summit. He's scheduled to meet with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the Queen. Then he goes to Brussels for a gathering of NATO alliance. The eight-day trip concludes with a summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Geneva, where the agenda includes Russia-based cyber attacks on U.S. entities. Turning now to the Asian nation of Myanmar, military and security forces continue attacks on civilians protesting the February coup. Thousands are seeking refuge in camps on the Thailand border. As Lucille Toulousan reports, CBN's Operation Blessing Thailand is undertaking a hazardous mission to help them. We've hidden the identities for security reasons. Mien is among those who fled Myanmar to escape the military atrocities. 
she and her four children left without her husband, a soldier fighting for the rights of the people. We dug holes under the ground where we hid most of the time because bullets and bombs fell in our village. The military raided our house and this is when we decided to escape for our safety. We walked for three days and crossed the border to Thailand. I am a Christian and I prayed so hard for us to arrive in this camp safely. We had to leave our cows and chickens, and now I feel frustrated that we live in shelters of other people and share very limited food. It's a Christian camp of the Myanmar Karen tribe that is taking care of thousands of refugees. The big challenge, however, is giving shelter to whole villages who now live in the forest. With no source of income, they lack food, medicines, and other basic needs. Despite the danger of being caught in the crossfire, a team from Operation Blessing Thailand was able to give much-needed help to the refugees. In coordination with the Karen leaders and soldiers, the Operation Blessing team brought sacks of rice, tents, medicines, and other basic needs to distribute to the refugees living along the border between Thailand and Myanmar. That included crossing this river to provide relief to refugees on the Myanmar side of the border. They also prayed for the refugees, including young students, now training for the Karen National Union Army to fight for the people's government. The military has always been dictators. They want to terminate all tribes or enslave us, disunite all religions. That's because they want to be in power forever. But now we have to make the best efforts to unite and fight the enemy, the military who has been oppressing the people and killing anyone who is against them. Thank you very much for helping us in this difficult time as we are being persecuted. We have no homes and no money. We face sickness and have no medicines, no roof to protect us from the sun and the rain. As a soldier, Wei Yan feels obligated to protect the refugees and the rest of the people of Myanmar. We need to stand against the coup, though our lives, our health, our economy are suffering. We demand equality and the citizens' rights. Thank you, Operation Blessing, for caring for the needy. The Bible says, I tell you the truth. What you have done to these little ones, you have done to me. I believe God has put your ministry's name in his book of life. May you and your family be filled with blessings. Lucille Talusan, CBN News. What you have done for the least of these, you have done it unto me. Pat? You know, the Koran people go way, way back. They're, they're, they almost have a biblical Christianity, and they've been persecuted terribly. And that group of colonels that took over uh, Myanmar, that they used to be called Burma, uh, have, have been nothing but dictators. And the fact that people who are Christians are now fleeing uh, from Burma, um, what they call it, Myanmar, into the Koran e area. And the Koran have been persecuted, but now they're beginning to stand up. But the thing is, we at Operation Blessing were able to reach out and help those persecuted Christians in Burma who are trying to survive against that deadly military coup. And if you want to give us a hand on that, and I wish you would, we have brought sacks of rice, tents, medicines, basic supplies, and we prayed with them. So we have a disaster relief fund. It's 1-800-707-000. And uh, let's do what we can. We're not going to let those uh, Myanmar or Burmese Christians suffer. And we're going to help, if we can, that uh, they're in the Karen region, and we want to see them strengthened. But we want to feed them, clothe them, and help them before they starve to death. The Golan Heights, to maintain control of this strategic land, is crucial for the nation of Israel. For decades, Syria ruled the area. So how did Israel obtain it? Through an uphill battle, from a rocky slope rising 1,700 feet from the Sea of Galilee. It was one of the biggest tank battles in the history of modern warfare. Chris Mitchells has the details of this crucial conquest. 
Whoever sits on the Golan Heights totally dominates this whole region. That's in part because of the proximity to the Sea of Galilee. The Golan Heights shares borders with Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, and Damascus is only 40 miles away. For decades, Syria controlled the Golan Heights. Here on the high ground overlooking the Sea of Galilee, Syrian artillery and snipers shot and shelled Israelis below. Children grew up running to bomb shelters, and residents lived under the constant threat of attack. So all along the line of this cliff, where Syrian bunkers and military posts and cannons and artilleries, the communities beneath the Golan Heights were totally at the mercies of the Syrians. Overlooking the Sea of Galilee, Middle East expert Avi Melamed told me why this ground is so important. Now, you have to remember, the Sea of Galilee is the biggest fresh uh, water body um, in Israel, providing something like 25, 30 percent of the water consumption or the fresh water consumption in Israel. In 1948 until 1967, what happened was that the Syrians occupied some strategic areas. The major result of that was an enormously increasing pressure on Israel, mostly in the context of the water and the use of water. Israel faced a literal uphill battle against the Syrian army, a rocky slope that rose 1,700 feet from the Sea of Galilee. Israel captured the Golan Plateau during the last two days of the Six-Day War. We were afraid that uh, Syria will come back. And again, they will shell the valley and try to take the water, to take the Jordan. We decided to make the first uh, kibbutz in the Golan Heights. And just a month after the war, Yehuda Harel and his family joined the first Israelis moving here. We got a permission from the army to get inside the Golan Heights because it was a military area. And uh, we got a job from them to collect cows that were wild in the area. They first lived in what had been housing for Syrian army officers. We are very near to Kunetra, about 100 meters from Kunetra. And we are near to the quarter that we used to live here for almost five years. This was the house that we, with uh, another three families, lived in this house. Eventually, the community moved across the ridge and still farms near the border. Today, close to 50,000 people, more than 25,000 Israelis, and about 22,000 Druze live on the Golan Heights. It's known for its fresh fruit, like the grapes used in award-winning Israeli wines. In the last uh, more than 40 years, the Golan Heights is the most quiet area of Israel. Everything happened in the other side of the border. But that could be changing. Do you see any similarities between the conditions prior to 1967 and the conditions now? I would say that the strategic threat, as far as Israel is concerned, is today much more severe in comparison to the pre-1967. The major reason for that is the presence of Iranians and Iranian-backed Shiite militias stone throw away from the Israeli-Syrian ceasefire line. Melamed said Iran wants to establish a new front here, similar to those established in South Lebanon and the Gaza Strip. Trying to launch a military front against Israel in the Golan Heights will uh, could result in a massive eruption because Israel would not stand for that, and rightly so. On the 49th anniversary of the Six-Day War, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made it very clear how Israel views the Golan Heights. They are for peace. In the stormy region around us, Israel is the stabilizing factor. Israel is the solution, not the problem. The Golan Heights will forever remain in Israel's hands. Israel will never come down from the Golan Heights. In 2019, Israel made another gain on the Golan Heights when U.S. President Trump recognized Israeli sovereignty over the strategic plateau. When we were only in the valley and the enemy was up on the hill, it was not peace. To live in peace, you have to be strong and to live in the higher place. In the meantime, the Golan Heights is quiet, but enemies on the other side of the border continue to plot against the Jewish state. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Golan Heights, Israel. I've been up there, it's fantastic. But I, I want the Israelis to have it, and I appreciate what President Trump did when he said that without question that belongs to Israel, and it does. It cannot be 
seated back, but as I said, it was one of the most fiercely fought tank battles in the whole history of, of, of tank warfare. And the Israelis fought up there, and it was a fantastic victory. 150 shows a year. The Oak Ridge Boys have been performing together for nearly 50 years. So what happened when the COVID pandemic shut down their show? And now, how have they come roaring back? See for yourself. It's one of the most recognizable songs in music history. And the 1981 hit by the Oak Ridge Boys just turned 40. For Dwayne Allen, Joe Bonsall, Richard Sturban, and William Lee Golden, performing that song never gets old. Well, I don't know that it feels like it's been 40 years, man. It's been a quick 40 years in some ways, I guess. It's almost like the Hallelujah Chorus now. We start doing that song, people start standing up. You know, it, it's, uh, it's quite phenomenal, really. Even here 40 years later, it's kind of fun to be on stage and look out there and see all the men. Uh, they're trying to do the young pop of my mouth part. <laughs> it really is fun. Beginning as a gospel quartet out of Nashville, the Oak Ridge Boys ventured into secular country music in the early 70s. The now Country Music Hall of Famers went on to collaborate with musical legends, perform for five presidents, and win five Grammys and numerous other awards. Country music legends, the Oak Ridge Boys. In all those years, they continued to write and perform songs with a positive, encouraging message. We want to give people something good to think about, to take them away from the problems they've been going through in their life all week long. When you leave our show, we want you to feel better than when you came. In their nearly 50 years together, the boys never stopped performing, averaging 150 or more shows a year. That is, until March 14, 2020, when the group performed what would be their last show before the COVID pandemic shutdown. It was a weird feeling, you know, and it was on the way home that we realized that we're probably going to be uh, not going to be working for a while. With their tour bus parked indefinitely, the four men were able to enjoy rare time at home with their families. Still, they couldn't wait to get back on the stage. Every one of us has spent our whole lives on the road in one group or another, and most of our lives on the road, singing, doing shows. That's what we are, that's what we do. All of a sudden, with that shut down, you're home. I love being at home, but the boys are, are we're made to sing. However, they say through the years there's always been something more than music binding them together and keeping them going even in their lowest moments, faith in Christ. Well, my faith is real simple. Each year I try to get closer to him and I don't make him complicated. I just make him welcome. God has really blessed us, man. He comes first and uh, we try to shine that light as well. Yeah, we never, ever, ever didn't believe that we would be okay. While their 2020 tour had to be canceled, that didn't keep them out of the studio. Revisiting their roots in gospel music, they returned to the style of old church hymns, which brought new music, renewed spirits, and perfect harmony. Hills of tunnels never falter, never fail. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. And it's just as natural as that. And that's the way the whole album came down. In August 2020, the boys recorded their new album, Front Porch Singing. It aims to share a positive message needed in the world today. I think God had a plan for this album. I really do. I think that it was bigger than the four of us even realized when we were working on it. If you look at all the songs that are on that album, every one of them has something good to say. And that's what we want people to get out of that album when they listen to it. And if you put Jesus at, at the very top of that, then man, you can move mountains. As 2021 got underway, the boys were able to get back on the road and to what they were made to do, sing. That's the answer to every single question. Let's sing. 
you're looking at four guys here right now that are chomping at the bits to get out there and do what our calling is in life. The Oak Ridge Boys are now on their Elvira 40 tour as they share both new music and highlight their classics. Most of this nation was singing Elvira with the Oak Ridge Boys. My faith in God is, is stronger in my life right now than it's ever been. I give him the honor, the praise, and the glory. And he's helped us get through a very, very trying year. The boys are back. You ain't kidding, man. We wish you love, life, and healing. Home, family, and faith. We all need love. It's been trying, but yet at the same time, I have felt comfort through all of it. And that's what faith really does. It, it comforts your soul. Jesus Christ can do that if you'll allow him to. For love, life, healing, home, family, and faith. The boys are back and they're better than ever. The Oak Ridge Boys' latest CD releases on June 11th. That's this Friday. Again, it's called Front Porch Singing, and you can find it wherever music is sold. Again, Pat, this Friday, these are your buddies. Right I here. want to see them. I'm, I'm, I love those guys. They're so <laughs> terrific, and they have come for various birthdays. They've, they've made it for every one of my birthdays. This year, they couldn't do it, but last year, it was so cold. We're out there outside, and it was freezing <laughs> cold. But they are our dear friends, and we love them. They're just great guys. Yeah, I can't wait till they come back to, to here yeah. to see to ca our campus. Well, that, that, I hope everybody gets that uh, uh, yeah. CD. From Porch Scene. You know it's going to be great. Oh, of course it is. Okay. Well, we got some email. Right, let's We're going to go for it right now with Joe writes in. He says, Pat, I grew up in an Orthodox church and was even baptized there. I told my mother the truth. I learned nothing. So I quit and went to another church where I learned everything deeper about the Lord Jesus. I even understood the Bible clearly. Is this wrong? Um, absolutely not. I mean, I think you, you have a right to go where you were fed. The Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And if the doctrine of the church where you're attending is doesn't agree with what the Bible teaches, then there's nothing in the world wrong. There are many, many, many churches. And, and so go get the one where the Bible is taught, where you're compatible, and where you're happy. Well, that's it. No problem. All right. Amen. All right, here's Carol. She says, hello, Pat. My daughter, along with her husband and son, had to move away from a home and job she loved due to the pandemic. She's having trouble finding a job and is not have it happy living in this state. What scripture or words of wisdom could you share with her to put her life back in perspective? Um, Carol, let me try Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That's God's will for you and for others. And, uh, you know, of course, Romans 8, 28, God works everything together for good to them that love him. But uh, God will work out things for you, so don't worry about it. All right. Yeah, I was thinking of Romans 8, 28, too, so you named both of them. Yeah. Two <laughs> great, two great right. scriptures. Right. Here's Patricia. She says, Dear Pat, I'm thankful, the Lord, uh, th thankful for the Lord for answered prayers in an act of faith, even though I'm still having medical issues and financial problems. I also tithe as an act of faith. If I take my medication, and I'm, am I stopping the Lord from healing me? Um, I don't believe so. Look, I believe God's given us medicine. He's given us skilled doctors. You know, we have at Regent University uh, a school of uh, nursing, and we have a school of health science. And I, I believe, I, I'm so grateful for the healing that is taking place, the skills that we have in our medical community. So it's not any uh, act of faith. Of course, if you have great faith and you can see God heal people, and I, as we have, uh, there's nothing wrong with seeking the Lord. But at the same time, uh, you, you're not sinning when you uh, avail yourself of the tremendous medical uh, achievements we have in our society. All righty. Amen. Let's go to Tyler. She says, is it wrong for a Christian to join a lawsuit they see on a TV commercial for if they did use the product and they had an adverse side effect? I used a product and developed a malignant tumor. God healed me, but I do have medical bills. Oh, uh, look, uh, these companies all have insurance and they're putting out medicine, 
and they know good and well that somewhere along the way there'll be some adverse effects to that medicine. That's why they buy insurance. Right. So to join in with a, uh, a class action lawsuit to collect some money to get paid for your bills, nothing wrong with that. But again, when you go into lawsuit against somebody, don't have bitterness in your heart. If you just say, I think it's important that we settle this uh, matter amicably and I know that you've set up a mechanism and I want my share to pay for my bills. Just that's it, okay? Okay, here's Kathy. She says, my pastor wants to start doing communion twice a month. I'm confused because I came from a church that served communion quarterly. Then when I got married and attended my husband's church, we had communion monthly with the former pastor. <laughs> but with the new pastor, twice a month. Is that a bit too much? I, I, no, it's not. I think... <laughs> Every um, they used to in the Old Testament. I think every week they had communion. They met together. The breaking of bread, and um, uh, it celebrates the Lord's death till He come back. He said, "I'm going to break this bread. This this cup is the new covenant in, the, in my blood. And as oft as you eat it, in remembrance of me, it's as off, oft as oft. oft. So there's nothing in the Bible that says when it's got to be done, but they certainly did it every week, as far as I can tell, in the New Testament. All right? You know, when you really study how deep the the real spiritual meaning of the communion, it is so good, you'll, you'd want to take it. Of course. As much but, as you could. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, in the Catholic Church, I mean, every time you have, you know, the... the Oh, anyhow, that's it. What's the next one? All right, here's Cher. She says, when a mother or father dies at a young age, 36, and leaves a young child, age 11, behind on the earth, can the deceased parents pray in heaven for the child? I have heard parents can watch over loved ones from heaven. Uh, I'm afraid that's not the way it works. So once you're in heaven and the child's on earth, there's nothing you can do. So I would recommend that you give the child, bring up the child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. That's that's where your prayer should be. But don't think when you get to heaven, you can control somebody on earth. It just doesn't work that way. All right. All right. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. A sweeping criminal takedown with more than 800 arrests in 16 countries. In Operation Trojan Shield, the FBI created an encrypted messaging app called Anon. It was placed on more than 12,000 phones and sent to 300 crime syndicates, syndicates to track criminals every move around the world. Police uncovered many drug stings and reportedly several murder for hire plots as well. There's no doubt cicadas are on people's radar this year, but now the weather radar is picking them up too. Take a look at this. DC area Doppler radar appeared cluttered this weekend from the invasion that's swarming the eastern United States. The oversized insects take over tree trunks and backyards while filling the airwaves with their mating call. The good news is they'll only stick around for about four to six weeks and won't be back for another 17 years. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Flee from their home in Iraq or face certain death. That was the only choice Vanessa and her family had. ISIS was out to kill them. So what did they do? Take a look. When Vanessa's family learned ISIS was closing in on their village in Iraq, their only choice was to flee from their home or face certain death. As Christians, ISIS would have killed us. We had to leave everything and come to Jordan. But here, I'm not allowed to have a job. I have two children and my wife to take care of. Operation Blessing gives Vanessa's family food each month. She and her brother missed more than a year of school. Then we invited them to our Christian school in Amman. The teachers are so nice to us, and we have lots of fun learning. Iraqi refugee children study Arabic, English, science, math, and history at no cost to their families. They also learn about the love of Jesus. Now they start getting ready hours before the bus arrives because they are so happy to see their teachers and friends. I thank God every day for this. With the support of Operation Blessing donors, Vanessa and her brother are getting a great education while their parents know they'll have enough food for their next meal. Without you, we would have nothing to eat and my children will still feel lost. 
You are the only ones who can help us, and I pray for you every day. Like any mother, I want my children to have a strong education and the best chance for a good future. They have that chance, and I'm forever grateful. You're the answer to my prayers. Thank you so much for caring about me and my family. Venom coursing through his body, sapping his last ounce of strength. A rattlesnake had sunk its fangs deep into Scott Buchanan's leg. Scott was dying, and he knew it. So he left his wife a goodbye message on his phone, and then he said to God, I'm ready to go. Hey, sweetheart. I love you so much. I got bit by a snake. I can't move hardly anything. So I don't know if I'm going to make it out of here or not, but I do love you. In August 2018, Scott Von Cannon was hiking near his cabin in North Carolina with his dog Boone. He stopped for a moment when he saw movement on the ground. Then he felt a painful sting in his leg. And I saw that it was a snake head and two fangs coming out, and I, I immediately jumped back. I'm like, oh my gosh, I just got bit by a snake. Scott had been bitten by a timber rattlesnake. He could taste the poison in his throat almost immediately. He quickly tied a tourniquet around his leg and tried to hike his way out. I pulled my phone out to call 911, and as soon as I uh, reached and pulled my phone out and it said no cell service, that's sort of when my heart sank. I felt the effects of the venom starting to react to my body, and I was losing equilibrium. My vision was getting more blurred. I was throwing up, uh, going in and out of consciousness. I, I think I had passed out maybe two or three times at that point. Scott collapsed on the trail nearly four miles from his truck. Meanwhile, his wife Nan was overcome with a terrible feeling as she drove to meet him at their cabin. Every time I would stop, I would call him, and then I started texting him, and then I just had this, this Honestly, it was just a spirit of dread. It was just kind of hovering over me, and um, my thoughts were just spinning. Um, what if something's happened to him? Nan soon found the trail map at the cabin, then drove to the trail. She located his truck, but there was no sign of Scott. She then drove to a hiking store where she met the fire chief's mother-in-law, and shortly after, a search was underway. All Nan could do now was trust God and pray. I had nothing else to do but trust him. Like that was what, what was I gonna do? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't affect anything right then but that. I would read a scripture or I would just, um, you know, just petition the Lord like, I, I, some help, help. She called Christian neighbors and family and an international prayer chain quickly spread. Meanwhile, Scott lay on the trail praying for rescue. When I began to pray to him, and focus on him, I just felt his presence. I felt, I felt that he was with me, you know, during this whole ordeal. And I just kept getting reassurance that he was gonna be with me through the whole thing. Scott fired a pistol into the air, hoping someone would hear the shot. He then made a video saying goodbye to his family. At that point, I really didn't fear death. I, did, I didn't, I, I had given in, um, I'd fought, you know, so much that afternoon to breathe and stay conscious and alert. But at around five o'clock, right before I made the video, I had given in to the Lord and basically said, I'm ready to go, Lord, please take me. About 7.30 that night, the first rescuer found Scott barely clinging to life. He called for others to hurry to the scene. His body was black, he was swollen. He was just black all the way up uh, his side. So, and going in and out of consciousness as well and his uh, pulse was low and uh, he was just not in a good, and his blood pressure was dropping fast. We immediately started to pray for him too because he looked like he was checking out. I, I remember telling them that I wasn't going to make it, that I, that I didn't think I would make it, and they kept encouraging me and telling me that they were going to get me out of there. Well, I just said, hey, mate, do you believe in Jesus? <laughs> because I knew he needed it. We knew that he had a long way to go ahead of him and he needed to really have all the strength. When he said, yes, I do, I knew we had a hope. Over two dozen rescue workers worked late into the night to transport Scott out from the steep terrain. They reached the ambulance after midnight. Chief Ryan Gearhart remembers seeing Scott as they loaded him into the ambulance. I mean, he literally was almost lifeless. Just the length of time that he was in there, 
and the venom going throughout his entire body. I mean, you just don't see people pull out of that. Once again, the team gathered to pray as the ambulance drove Scott to a life flight helicopter. Scott received 12 shots of anti-venom at the hospital and spent three days in the ICU. His liver, kidneys, and intestines had shut down, yet miraculously began healing. When he woke days later, he knew God had saved him. I knew God was present. I knew he was there. I knew he was taking charge of every sit part of the situation. And uh, everything had to work just in perfect harmony and perfect, uh, in, in his perfect timing for me to be alive and to be here talking to you. I, I, I shouldn't be here. Miraculously, Scott made a full recovery and has no lasting effects from the snake bite. He and Nan are thankful for the prayers and the hand of God that caused all things to work together for his survival. Absolutely, it's a miracle. Everybody um, that listened to the prompting to, to do what they did, I think it just all came together in this, this one big miracle to, to glorify the Lord. He, Scott is a miracle, right? Like he, the Lord is still working miracles because he is one, because I saw it. Physically, it was the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life, but spiritually, it was probably the best thing I've ever been through. But the Lord showed me that, you know, I'm not always in control of every situation and, and you know, that He's in control and that I needed to lean on Him and lean into Him to, to make it out of there. And that's what I gave into. I just gave into being with Him and, and letting Him lead the way. What a story of miracles. God is able. Now, we've got a time to pray for you. Wendy and I are going to pray for you. But first, I want to share some of the things that are happening. There was a lady named Arlene who lives in Dayton, Ohio. She had chronic pain from arthritis. She was watching our program. She heard Wendy say, somebody, you have severe arthritis. Doctors are saying you have to live with it. But God says, not today. <laughs> He's touching you and arthritis is leaving. And guess what? She's healed. I love it. Here's one. Mary of Dothan, Alabama felt excruciating foot pain from a condition called plantar fasciitis. Mary was watching the 700 Club when she heard you say, Pat, someone has plantar fasciitis. Your foot is so painful right now. Just put your hand on your foot and in the name of Jesus, touch. Mary put her hand on her aching foot. Within minutes after praying, the pain was gone. Praise yes. God. You say, how does that happen? I want you to know something. God Almighty is just that. He can fix anything because He made you. He knows what's wrong with you, and He knows how to fix you. And the Bible says there's not one person who ever came to Jesus for healing who didn't get healed. Not one. Sometimes He put them off a little bit to test their faith, but He always healed them. Now, we're going to join hands. Yes. I'm going to ask you to pray with us. Thank Father, you. in Jesus' name, we thank and praise you for these answers to prayer. We praise you for the answer of what you're going to do right now. Oh, my God. Thank you, God. Somebody, I said, Marcella, you've got liver cancer, and the doctors have said maybe there's no hope. Yes, there's hope. In the name of Jesus, touch that cancer. Wendy. There's someone you just received a bad report, and you're a strong believer, but all of your hope and faith have just left the building. God is asking you today to get your hope back, read his word, the power of life and death is in the tongue, start proclaiming what is true, because God thank says you. you are healed you, in Jesus' God, name. God, we praise you, we thank you, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, th there's a, some kind of a stomach uh, upset situation. It's not ulcers, but uh, you, you've been having terrible pain in your abdomen, in that whole area. Uh, I think it's Mary. Uh, just take it in the name of Jesus. Touch her. Uh, There's someone with really painful varicose veins. Uh, thank you. I, I think they're in both legs, but God is, just put your hand on your legs right now. God's touching you, and you're going to be delivered in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Somebody, you've got a, a very painful bone spur in your left uh, heel, and God is it's just dissolving. It's a calcium deposit. It's dissolving right now, even as we speak, in Jesus' name. Now, Father, 
We pray for America. Yes. We pray for this great nation. We pray for the families. We pray as a division and all these elections and the yes. migrants that come to the border. We pray, O oh God, that you will take this nation through and make us a planting of your pleasure in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Let us hear from you. We love to hear the answer of what God's done in your life. And we leave you today with the words of Jesus from the book of Luke. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Well, tomorrow, what are called woke adoptions. What are they and how could they backfire on little children? So for Wendy and all of us, thanks so much for being with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the same time tomorrow. God bless every one of you. Please stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.